Hi again everybody. So this is my last 10 minute video. So in the last video we talked about sympatric speciation and how sympatric speciation can occur via disruptive selection in populations of organisms. That process, the process that I described using the example of the soapberry beetle and the soapberry tree, happens quite slowly, but there is a way in which sympatric speciation can happen really quickly, and that's through a process called polyploidy. Now, polyploidy is a mutation. So remember when we were discussing meiosis and we talked about non-disjunction events and mistakes that can happen as a result of those non-disjunction events in the production of gametes? Well, that's what polyploidy is. Polyploidy is a non-disjunction event. And what it results in, either in mitosis or meiosis, it results, is, it results in cells or gametes that have more chromosomes or double the number of chromosomes that they should have. This is a very common type of speciation in plant populations, particularly sympatric plant populations. And the reason why this is an example of sympatric speciation is because these polyploid individuals that eventually result from these non-disjunction events cannot interbreed with normally their diploid progenitors. So reproductive isolation occurs, genetic isolation occurs, and then if those polyploid individuals can reproduce and evolutionary forces act on them, then you can have speciation happen. So let's talk a little bit about um, what happens during um, the, produc the production of polyploid gametes in, an, in a cell that's about to undergo meiosis. So here's a cell in which a non-disjunction event is about to happen. This particular cell is actually in metaphase 1 of meiosis. I'll just write that down. So this guy is in metaphase 1 of meiosis. Now you know that in metaphase 1 what normally happens is the centrosomes are over here and over here and what they're doing is they are producing microtubules that begin to interact with the chromosomes. Okay. So what happens during a non-disjunction event that will result in polyploid gametes in this example is that one of the centrosomes is producing microtubules and is appropriately interacting with the chromosomes and the other centrosome is not. Okay, so what happens then is in the first division of meiosis what will happen is in the resulting cells you get twice the number of chromosomes that should be in the cell in one particular cell and then no chromosomes in the other cell. Now what you should be able to do is you should be able to go through the rest of meiosis and see what results in those gametes, okay? So you should be able to do that at this point. So what will happen now is eventually in the gametes is that you have no chromosomes in one cell and you have double the number of chromosomes in the other cell. In this case it'll be six chromosomes in the other cell. Okay, And this is our mutant. Now here's what else has to happen. If these mutant gametes are fertilized by other mutant gametes, what happens is, is you get a polyploid zygote. You get a zygote that has twice the number of chromosomes that it should have. That polyploid zygote will then undergo mitosis, cell differentiation, and growth to produce an adult. That adult is then a polyploid individual. And believe it or not, it seems like this is a whole series of highly unlikely events to occur but it happens and it has happened and is happening quite frequently in plant populations. Okay. But the main point here is that these polyploid individuals are now genetically and reproductively isolated from the diploids, okay, so that 
evolutionary forces can act on those polyploids and speciation can occur, right? So, but how is it that the polyploids are genetically isolated from the diploids? Well, if you take here a tetraploid parent, okay, and a diploid parent, that diploid parent cell will eventually produce haploid gametes. However, tetraploid parents, or that tetraploid plant parent cell, will produce diploid gametes. So you get haploid gametes from the diploid parent and diploid par gametes from the tetraploid parent. Now, that doesn't necessarily prevent these gametes from fusing. They can fuse. But what will happen is that this will result in a triploid zygote. So in other words, it results in a cell that has an odd and not an even number of chromosomes. Okay? All of the gametes that this triploid individual will produce, if it can produce gametes at all, will have different numbers of chromosomes and will have uneven numbers of chromosomes. You can try to take this triploid um, parent through meiosis and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about. And these, um, when these gametes combine, if they can combine at all, they, the, all of the resulting individuals have an odd number of chromosomes and they really pretty much are infertile. So all of these, um, all of these triploid individuals produced by the mating of a diploid and a tetraploid individual in a population will actually be infertile. They, just, they cannot reproduce with another individual and they can't even reproduce with themselves. They can't self at all. Okay, so this results in those tetraploid individuals being genetically isolated, reproductively isolated from those diploids. Now, if the original polyploid plant can actually self or reproduce egg sexually, this is what happens in plants, and produce offspring, which can happen very easily, then evolutionary forces can act upon those offspring and you often get speciation and pretty quickly actually in a lot of different plant populations. So this is a really important process. Alright, so let's look at an example of how it is that a process called autopolyploidy can happen in a group of plants. And we're going to use ferns as an example because ferns are notorious for having polyploid individuals in their population. And those polyploid individuals can actually, if their evolutionary forces impact them, develop into new species. So here's the normal life cycle of a fern. Every fern that you look at out in the forest is a, well, unless it's a polyploid, but let's just take it as an example here, is a diploid plant. So every fern you see as you're walking around outside is diploid. What happens is on the undersides of those leaves of the uh, parent plant, they produce by meiosis haploid spores. Those haploid spores are released from this, the plant, dispersed into the environment. They land on a rock or on the soil and they produce a gametophyte. This gametophyte results from mitosis, okay? So the, um, the, the gametophyte generation itself results from mitosis and then also the production of sperm and eggs on that gametophyte or gamete producing part of this plant life cycle are also produced by mitosis, but they're all haploid. When those haploid sperm and eggs fuse with one another and um, ferns often self, that is the sperm on a one gametophyte can actually fertilize the eggs on that same gametophyte, then you get the production of a diploid zygote. That diploid zygote then undergoes mitosis, cell differentiation, and growth to produce a diploid plant. Now, what happens to make these things polyploid and why is polyploidy so rampant? You start off with a diploid uh, plant here, but a mistake happens during meiosis. This is the problem. Okay, so here 
is where you have your mistake happens, happen. Instead of producing haploid spores, a non-disjunction event happens and you get diploid spores. By mitosis, you have the production of a diploid gametophyte generation. All the sperm and eggs produced by this gametophyte generation will be, will be diploid. When those sperm fertilize those egg cells, fertilization happens and you get the production of a polyploid zygote. That polyploid zygote then undergoes mitosis, cell differentiation, and growth to produce not a diploid individual, but a polyploid parent that has twice the number of chromosomes. Okay? This happens all the time in ferns. This is an example of polyploidy. And again, like I said, if in these new polyploid individuals evolution um, by natural selection or genetic drift impacts them, then they will develop into a new species. There's also another process that can result in polyploidy, and it's called allopolyploidy. Allopolyploidy involves hybridization. It involves the gametes from two separate species fusing together to form a zygote. And then you have a mutation occur in that zygote such that you get double the number of chromosomes produced in that organism, and then when it produces gametes, it'll produce diploid and not haploid gametes. So let's go through this. Here in this figure, you have species 1 to the left and species 2 to the right. Totally two different species. These guys end up hybridizing with one another. They both produce regular haploid gametes, okay? Those haploid gametes fuse. These Haploid gametes, though, because they are from separate species, the chromosomes are different. They have different genes, they're probably of different sizes, and so they don't synapse correctly. And so what normally happens with hybrids, a, this, a hybrid individual that results like this, is that it's infertile. It can't reproduce, okay? Except for if there is another error in meiosis or mitosis in this diploid hybrid offspring, you get a doubling of the number of chromosomes producing a polyploid and that polyploid, polyploid individual produces gametes by meiosis. They're going to be diploid gametes, okay? Now, these or, these, this um, species, or I should say, this individual that underwent chromosome doubling to produce these diploid gametes, if those diploid gametes can fertilize each other, then you get the establishment of a polyploid, polyploid population in nature. And then, of course, as before, these polyploid individuals are reproductively isolated from their diploid parents. Most of the time, there are exceptions to this, but most of the time. What's cool is that this, this um, species, sympatric speciation by, uh, by polyploidy is pretty frequent. And you know where it happens the most? is actually in our agricultural plants and animals. So if you look at agricultural plants, up here are the flowers of a potato. That's um, an autopolyploid. Strawberries are allopolyploids. Bananas are um, um, autopolyploids. Coffee is an allopolyploid. And rainbow trout is actually an allo, the, most of the, the trout that we consume are allo polyploids. So this is a pretty common um, phenomenon that impacts not only plants, but sometimes animals. Okay, so we'll see you on Tuesday.